Hello and welcome to another recording of the Social Media Newsroom. We are back with more news, reviews, rants and raves about your favourite social networks. I say we because, of course, I'm joined as always by Natalie Emene from Okoko Media. Natalie, welcome back. Hi, Pascal. Thank you once again for having me back. Not at all. I look forward to this. It's like the highlight of the month. Um, <laughs> it's lovely because I have to say, thanks to this kind of regular show, I am more disciplined to a keep track of what's changing on social media, but there's also the pleasure in sharing it. And to you, viewers and listeners, thank you again for your support and comments when we share this recording on the, the interweb. It's always lovely to get little thumbs up and and thank yous. Now, uh, in the green room, you and I were saying that it has been a busy month for the social network, so there's a lot to go through. So we're going to go through the news updates um, rapidly. If you're new to the show, the first segment, as I mentioned a moment ago, is the news roundup, thinking what's changed and what could have some bearing in the way in which we plan and execute our social media campaigns. And the second segment is more around strategies and, and tools that uh, would be new to you that would suggest you can try out, perhaps indeed bolster the impact of your campaign. Now, typically, we don't follow the the, the headlines and the news, you know, we try and go deep diving into the more discreet announcements. But frankly, it would be very difficult to avoid the news from Twitter. It would seem that all of us now, Twitter account holders, our landlord is Elon Musk. Yes, and that's, you know, somewhat <laughs> exciting and somewhat controversial, probably in equal measures. Um, I can't imagine um, for his new 9.2% stake, which they've also allowed him a space on the board, he's going to be just sort of taking a back seat and quietly letting things uh, continue as they were. So I imagine this is probably going to be one of those seismic social media shakeups. But whether we see that happen in the next months and years, or whether we see that in the next couple of weeks will uh, probably depend on his schedule and other projects I would imagine um, so I think it will probably be the beginning of perhaps a little bit more of a new dynamic uh, phase for Twitter I think we'll probably see a little bit more testing perhaps a little bit more uh, edginess and I've got to say one of the first things because I've been keeping a clo even closer eye um, on uh, on his socials since uh, since the announcement was made Usually he's one of those figures on Twitter that's impossible to ignore anyway. Um, but I have seen some murmurs about whether Twitter needs an edit button. And he's been conducting a few polls on that. For long-term Twitter users, it has always been a bit of a... Uh, a bit of an ongoing point um, as to whether we do need the ability to edit our tweets or whether that allows opportunity for even more fake news and fake endorsements to uh, to come in. So it be really, really interesting uh, to see how it all plays out. Yeah, no, I would agree with you. I can't imagine just come to a meeting to sign a few bit of paperwork and not have something to say. Um, I, I will confess, it's more my ignorance about how those things work, but when I heard they had, is it 9.2% share, and they made the majority shareholder, I thought that was smaller. I don't know, when I heard the word majority shareholders, <laughs> I thought it would be in the double figures. Um, and, and, you know, it just shows what a brutal world this is in terms of investment, because, of course, I think when I was um, checking the news, Jack Dorsey, who is the inventor, certainly the co-inventor of Twitter, has less than 3%. You know, it's just kind of um, the way that those things go. So what well, we shall see, but for the very recent news and updates from Twitter, what do you have for us? Well, lots of, uh, I guess, behind the scenes things going on with Twitter and lots of things that are in different phases and different levels of testing. Um, one of the biggest highlights for me for this month has definitely been Twitter communities. So looking at those micro community updates. Now, Twitter communities is probably for a really easy uh, kind of basic comparison for the, the interest of speed and running through things. It's probably a little bit of a Facebook group, but on Twitter. So it gives you a space where you're actually able to have conversations and connect and share with those people who are interested in a same topic as you are. Now, uh, Twitter communities work a little bit like groups, as in they're moderated by a group of individuals. So they're not completely unmoderated spaces. They are spaces that you effectively would become a member of and then can contribute to discussions of. And the rest of us mere mortals can sort of stand by on the, the sidelines and look at the, the Twitter community discussions. Um, but it's really something that we would have to then either be invited to participate in and have our voices heard or to uh, basically apply to, uh, to, to join that, that, 
particular Twitter community. So it's a little bit more of a protected conversation. I think it probably allows a little bit more of a safe space to discuss real issues and things that are important to people without necessarily any type of uh, trolling or any type of conversation that detracts. Also keeps that Twitter community safer from bots and scams and anything that might just be popping up, giving a less than ideal user experience of, uh, of the platform. But I think it's going to be quite an exciting new chapter and definitely anything that's an exciting new way for people to connect on a platform. Um, really good to see. What are your thoughts on it, Pascal? Well, uh, I was just thinking about it and it's almost as though, once again, you know, Twitter is looking for the thing. And or as a social network, you know, th they've been, let's call it features poor. But I always believe that that was on purpose to really stand out from, from the crowd. And then they've done a couple of very interesting things with live streaming. You know, we had the Periscope, Twitter Live, and then they have Twitter Spaces and so on. So this idea, for me particularly, to be able to go live on Twitter for a specific community is a lot more appealing than a, a broadcast. Do you know what I mean? Uh, because mm -hmm. uh, there will be followers that are not necessarily part of my kind of tier one, two kind of prospects and customers. So it's kind of interesting, which is it feels like they are undoing what was making them unique but um if they can bring in the, the live streaming particularly which has been a, one of their strengths that'd be very interesting for me oh completely i think it'll give it a nice community for want of a better word uh feel to to that space where twitter can often be a little bit colder a little bit more savage um so it, it gives you that balance but i i do get what you're saying that it's just yet another thing for Twitter to be trying uh, <laughs> to try and find where mm. where it where it wants to go what what it wants to be when it grows up and we'll uh, we'll see. So are there in any other updates? Sorry, from Twitter. Yeah, so in terms of testing, we are still seeing um, Twitter Blue continuing to be tested, uh, not in the UK at the moment, but essentially this is their paid subscription service, which gives you access to uh, new additional features. Um, we are seeing even more integration of NFTs into Twitter Blue. Again, coming back to that, let's see what else we can throw it in. Um, and I'm not sure whether that's an entirely positive thing, but you will see those those uh, kind of signs kicking about on your Twitter journeys, the little hexagonal problem profile picture with a, an NFT in there um, is uh, quite uh, quite prevalent at the moment. We're seeing more testing around the idea of downvoting, so invisible downvoting um, in a way that allows users a little bit more control over their own spaces um, and the types of contributions that they're, that users are having to things that they are posting, whether it's relevant, whether it is spam, whether it is something that's just completely detrimental to the conversation. So really interesting to see that continue and that work going on um, behind the scenes. One of the main features that caught my eye is a possible testing of long format content. So this is the idea that you can post almost a blog post on Twitter. Now, for anyone who is using the platform, you will see that often features follow user behavior patterns. So you will see on your Twitter journeys, people that do those long screenshots. So it's usually out of like their notes app or screenshot from something else. And they might attach it as images. And then this becomes a whole thread. And it's quite a, a, a it's more of a effort to then consume that media like that. So Twitter's testing the opportunity to give this long formatted post, not entirely dissimilar to quote another network would be LinkedIn articles. So the ability to publish onto the platform directly in something that is a little bit slicker than a screenshot that you uh, take off your phone, but allows you to articulate a point or give an example in something just more than those 240 characters uh, or having to put in a thread with multiple uh, kind of, you know, points of having to click on. And I, well, as much as I love a Twitter thread and I love a bit of a deep dive into a topic, uh, if it's something where you actually want to read the discussion and check out the comments and follow the conversation, the uh, the traditional thread format can be very, very difficult. I find myself sort of clicking multiple points. Oh, I've already read those comments. I've missed these over here. Um, so it's uh, it's nice to see the innovation. Again, I'm not sure this is going to be the, the silver bullet for the platform, but really interesting to see. Uh, perhaps further footstep away from that that short form uh, 240 character limit content on that well thank you very much a couple of things that i came across myself so twitter uh, essentially rolling out professional accounts to everyone so you know in the past you had to to apply 
And if you're not familiar with them, if you go, particularly on your desktop, it's much easier, or your laptop, if you go into your uh, profile settings and, of course, click, I think actually it's listed now. It wasn't behind the three dots, which is always the way. If you notice, Natalie, that everything that is good about the inter internet uh, is always behind the three dots. So <laughs> they now have Twitter Professional, I think. You click on it and you can go through a very, very simple registration process and you can actually undo what you've done it gives you just some extra you know space to explain what you do product listings and of course the newsletter module with the review that we mentioned a few episodes ago but the one article that i received from um twitter was was, was interesting was around advertising so they're they're trialing with some of the brands and some of the kind of regular advertisers three additional ways to advertise. So the one called the interactive text ads. I don't know if you come across that news item. So oh, I've seen headlines on it, but tell yeah. me more. No, no, I mean, so it would seem that you know you, you you create a tweet and you can highlight some of the words within the tweet and turn them into hyperlinks to essentially your your website or to even. Um, I call it um, a destination like a landing page. Uh, and again, you would pay per click, I would imagine. So the interactive text ads have been trialed. Then you have what they've called formerly the product explorer ad, which is essentially rendering your products into 3D, which is kind of interesting. There was a demonstration of the usual products. But the one that I thought was very interesting is called the collection ad. Imagine that you have a, a an image, a large image, of a product and below you will have five smaller image in a carousel so you have the, your lead image almost and then below you could have almost uh, you know different facets for that product or or different angles so they are rolling this out across the brands and it'll be accessible to people who so happen to open their professional account yeah, I think it'll be really interesting to see those share, but particularly for me, the uh, the interactive text allows the opportunity to perhaps test a few keywords in there, which is mm -hmm. always vital because sometimes as marketers, you don't all, if you are doing something that's a little bit different, you don't always know what the exact point of resonance with your audience is going to be until you start exploring that. So I'd see that as an amazing phase for being able to do a little bit more ad development or even audience development there. Um, and for the product, I love anything that can take customers on more of a journey because sometimes it's not quite enough to catch their attention to then always get the click sometimes you get the attention and they go huh but then if you haven't given quite enough in in that moment you lose the click as they, as they kind of scroll on so it just gives you those extra opportunities to really not just say oh look this is really cool just say this is really cool it's gonna work for you x y and z it just rounds that nicely which says a bit of an advertiser's dream for uh, actually introducing something and particularly for something that isn't even necessarily product-led that could be a service or something digital where it's really hard to represent that in one image allows you to create a bit more of an emotional connection with the audiences this sounds fab and nice to see some actual ad innovation from the platform no, absolutely. So, and very quickly, there's still some whispers and kind of um, grumbles about the fact that Twitter could become a podcast host, which is all linked to Twitter Spaces. And I have to say, with Twitter Spaces, I am so impressed by the development team. They go live, I would say, once a week probably, and they give updates to everyone about what they get up to and they get requests from the audience and so on. So there's something really interesting happening there with regard to live. Okay, can we move on to Instagram, please? Yes, absolutely. So again, another busy month if we start to uh, to head over to uh, to Insta. Uh, so parent company Meta are launching a new family center and parental controls, uh, which is something that we often get asked about, not necessarily in a professional capacity uh, here at Okoko, but often if we are working with, uh, with individuals and they're like, oh, hey, my daughter has Instagram and I don't understand it. It's the type of thing that will, that will come up. Um, the aim is to try and demystify uh, how the platform works and there's also for parents of younger children so bear in mind for instagram you do need to be 13 plus to, to register for account but even at the age of 13 14 15 uh, chances are mom and dad or parent or carer would actually quite want to have a high level of input but might not necessarily want to entirely cramp the style of you have to post on parents phone uh, for example so 
what we're seeing is new ways to set up alerts that come through to your mobile or your meta system um, that essentially give you updates on what's happening on your child's account. Um, these are real-time updates, so it doesn't rely on you remembering that you have to check on in on this uh, once a week or forgetting or that there's an update and you then can't log in or there's, there's some sort of problem. Um, in regards to uh, new followers that are following um, your, your child, and new accounts that they're following um, and then just other user behavior patterns that really just help you understand what is being shared online and what sort of experience your child is having just to promote better dialogue um, and there's lots of great tools in that uh, parental control family resource center that just help demystify the platform as a whole so if you do have uh, children or young people in your life who are starting to use social media and you want to keep a very helpful watchful eye on it but without having to constantly interrogate them this is just a really nice way of keeping that dialogue consistently open while everyone still feels that they get their privacy and that you know it's, it's not it's not a big cringy uh for god's sake i don't want to talk about it anymore type conversation um, so it's all about, in terms of Instagram this month, improving user experience. There's been some key changes to how audiences can consume posts on the platform. And they're offering two new ways to experience your Instagram feed, which is either by favorites or by following. So what you're able to do in both of these instances is switch your Instagram timeline to chronological order. And anyone who's old enough to remember when Instagram was just an app on Apple phones, um, you will know that we have missed the chronological order of Instagram so, so much. It allowed you to ensure that you're actually not really missing any posts. Posts, um, which for audiences where you follow a lot of accounts because you love seeing variety of content, perhaps less relevant. But for anyone that on the platform who's genuinely just using it to stay in touch with a select group of family and friends and a select group of brands and businesses that they genuinely are very, very interested in, this will result in a much, much better, stronger user experience, I'm sure. You're also able to filter that by favorites. So if you are a person that follows a lot of accounts, but you have your routine favorites, you you can then switch your feed to just see those posts in chronological order. So you're going to be able to feel more up to date with the content that's being shared. You're experiencing it more in real time because it is in that chronological order. And it makes it a little bit easier to stay on top of your content. So interesting to see these new features and just offering people another way to experience the platform um, and really help sort of mend some of that negative user experience reporting that we have seen. Because when it comes to mental health and user experience, Often Instagram is at the bottom of the chart in terms of you know polls and uh, and kind of votes on on the subject. That's very interesting. And you know this idea of improving. It, it does feel almost like Instagram was always left a little behind. You know there was so much development made with uh, Facebook, the, the the core product, with Messenger, with WhatsApp, and so on. That Instagram was getting tweaks, but that feels a bit more um, intentional. I mean, the other thing that I came across as a news item was they were adding a new messaging features. So they're really trying to get people to keep in touch with each other. Because I think the danger with Instagram, it was becoming almost like a consumption platform, but there was no real, I mean, my customers will tell me, you know, that they work hard across all networks. And Instagram is the one where they don't feel like they are connecting in a meaningful way compared to the others. So that that's lovely. There's also a lot more sharing going on. So I came across news about sharing music from different platforms. Um, this idea of also putting direct links to images to your products and so on. So there's really this idea of if Instagram is your favorite social network, let's not give it a lesser experience to the rest of the meta family. Yeah, completely. And really interesting to see them focus on that and that um, messaging side of things because one of the things that we do talk about um, with our clients in terms of Instagram is understanding that we can measure all of our metrics of things that happen on posts, but there is a little bit of a subculture on Instagram of the what we would refer to as dark activity, so the things that you can't measure, where users are actually sending content to each other in, in private chats and sharing that that content individually. Um, so anything like that will from a individual user experience, just the ability to better communicate with other individuals that you're actually connected to, bring a 
greater sense of well-being but for brands and businesses allowing users to engage more privately in regards to that content is a is a really nice and beneficial um kind of user experience so nice to uh, nice to see the development there and yeah um also some new creator lab uh, resource centers um so they've uploaded a selection of new videos to that and um, just better explaining what you can do on instagram if you want to get more from your presence now these are a little bit i guess it's just a sign of the times pascal they are a little bit featured towards people who might want to consider themselves to be influencers but where best practice is best practice there's still plenty of things that, that brands and uh, individuals can learn from those videos as well no from at all interestingly i um re- was looking into um f8 now you know you and i every year we look forward to the, the facebook or now meta big conference every year for everyone the um, Mark Zuckerberg and all the product leads so that would be people who are heading the WhatsApp development team and the messenger team and the Instagram team and more and even um, Oculus every year they announce their plans for the coming year and for people like Natalie and I it's so important because we get a heads up on some of the things that are going to come true a month later that we can f- give you a heads up and we can start to adapt our practices accordingly. Now, interestingly, there are no, there's no information whatsoever about F8, the big conference, but there is one called the Conversations Conference. And Meta, the artist previously known as Facebook, is essentially um, having an online conference on the 19th of May, which is all about the messaging platform. So that's WhatsApp, that's Messenger, and that's Instagram, and probably a couple of others that um, we, don't, we don't know because it'd be more l- local to a, a particular nation. And so I've registered. I will, I'll put the link in, in the show notes. But um, so two things. Is that interesting that that's what they've gone for, the Conversations Conference? And no news about F8, you know, which is about all the other products. Yeah, it's a bit of an anomaly because F8 is something that ever since the very first F8, they've pushed it very, very hard. And it's always been seen as the absolute pinnacle of getting Mark Zuckerberg and obviously other kind of senior leaders within the uh, now meta family out front and center to talk about um, the progression of the platforms and what direction they're going in. It's also perhaps even more recently in, in kind of the, you know, the last couple of years, really given a creative direction to the uh, AR and VR elements of, of the, the Facebook and Meta platform. And particularly with Meta, the idea of the metaverse coming more into play, you could imagine hypothetically that this would just be something that Facebook would want to double down even more on because if they build the technology and the platform it that's fine but really they need the content the games the experiences to populate it so it's a bit of an interesting kind of pull back on that element and hopefully it will pop up later in the year it might just be a scheduling issue um but really really interesting and perhaps it would indicate my inner conspiracy theorist uh, <laughs> that there might be something quite big in the works that they're not quite ready to announce they might need to another couple of months for a bit of a competitive announcement uh, competitive announcement competitive advantage ahead of any type of, of uh, announcement to, to kind of give the, the game away. But I think it'll be really interesting to see. In terms of the conversations, I think this can only be a good thing. We have seen a few little updates with WhatsApp recently, just in terms of better features for WhatsApp for business and better features for um, being able to log into your WhatsApp on a desktop or a laptop. Previously, you had to be very close to your phone. Literally in the last maybe 10 days, it now gives you the opportunity to log in and operate on that mobile number without having your phone physically near um, the the device. So interesting to see that and whether that will hint at one of the areas that Facebook has always struggled to monetize, which is the the private peer-to-peer communication, whether we will start to see more space for brands to actually perhaps not get involved in those individual conversations but certainly give them the opportunity to buy a little bit of visibility in that space where people are meaningfully interacting and engaging on the platform so yeah all good to see and i think anything that promotes 
actual positive human interaction on a peer-to-peer level is always the best possible use of, of social media anyway. No, absolutely. So listen, this is taking place on the 19th of May. So here's a thing for you. You know, We've not spoken about it, so the audience will see the surprise on your face or hear it in your voice. How about if we record the Social Media News Roundup a bit later, so literally a few days after the 19th of May, and we give our lovely audience the update, the summary, but also our reaction to the announcements around the con- conversations, the Meta Messaging Conference. That sounds awesome. That sounds like a plan, yeah. <laughs> we have a plan. Excellent. Well, talking of plans, we do have one today because next in line is LinkedIn. Yes, so LinkedIn is a busy, busy network uh, this month. It, we are currently at the point of recording. Uh, LinkedIn is in the middle of the LinkedIn Marketing Summit. And this has been something that we've been avidly consuming in the office. And it's been a little bit of a, I'm going to say a controversial one, because what we typically expect from a social platforms marketing summit is a little bit of best practice, some great examples that sort of, as marketers, they put them in front of you and they go, hey, look how cool this campaign was. Look at the results that they got. And you ah, oh, we need to do something like that. How can we be inspired by this? And let's let's get excited or they tease a new feature, new targeting options. LinkedIn's taking a different approach to this marketing summit and we're focusing, they're focusing on sustainability, best business practice and business ethics. So these are things that are very, very interesting to learn about and very, you know, often as marketers, we do believe that we can change the world through good marketing um, and we can make people's lives genuinely better and, and, and those sorts of things. So these are, you know, core values that that I think a lot of individuals will, will hold close. But it's interesting to hear a social platform talk about them and it's interesting to see them talk about them to the, I guess, the detriment of we're not actually talking about any LinkedIn features right now we are just talking about brand sustainability brand equality um because there's a lot going on and it almost is putting in my humble opinion a large amount of pressure on marketers to convey messaging that really talks about the efforts that that business might be taking to the point where are they taking them or not? So a little bit of that sort of greenwashing type um, kind of to quote a buzzword on it. If it's not a direction that's coming from the top and the board and it's something that the marketing department are trying to shoehorn in, it's something that leaves the brand fundamentally at risk. And it's something that that we see, um, you know, on a a kind of almost even day-to-day basis that this is a space where even for brands that are doing a lot of social good, struggle to actually um, communicate that in a way that comes across as authentic and real and presents it well with no risk of um, kind of, you know, any negative, unwanted uh, kind of attention for it. So what we tend to see is that the brands that are doing the most tend to talk about it a little bit um, and could possibly be talking about it more and the ones that are often out there front and center are the ones that are sometimes doing the least behind the scenes and for us if we get asked by any client or any project that we're consulting on oh can we start to talk about this particular issue or this particular you know awareness month our first question is always well, what are you doing about it that we can also talk about in, in line with this? Um, and uh, it, it, it's very, very interesting to see how that does or does not prompt a good response from the individual that you are that you are talking to. Um, the one that sticks in my mind, I probably shouldn't tell you, Pascal, but I'm going to tell you, uh, <laughs> is we were working on a, a one-off consultancy project and uh, we got a photo of uh, Carnaby Street and it was some bollards that had been painted for Pride um, for the month and the client sent us some pictures saying, oh, I'm in a meeting in London and I've, I've photographed these. Could we put them out on social media for, for like Pride and, and kind of raising us? We said, oh, great like you know thanks what are you guys doing for for like the awareness or or kind of any fundraising oh no we're not we're not doing anything it's just a picture of the bollards so um it's kind of the phrase i guess it's just a picture of bollards uh for us in the office but it's got to be from that really authentic place and it's really interesting to see a social network almost skew the idea of putting the 
I guess, effort and emphasis of sustainability and quality onto marketing teams whose job is there just to communicate the brand, not necessarily communicate the entire structure and strategy of the business. So it's been a really strange conference. Um, and I think a lot of the, the content is quite ambitious um but i would really like just a deep dive on a case study um of an ad that got some really great click throughs um, and some good conversions so it's been an interesting week with linkedin um to, to kind of just completely divert and go down that uh, that kind of avenue but it has been interesting and it's very very interesting to see a network itself try and tackle something that is such a big issue um that we all do need to be aware of but perhaps this is not what a marketing summit necessarily should be for marketers and interestingly i came across some of the uh, the recordings you know because some of something they had like almost breakout sessions live on linkedin what i will say as well oddly was poorly promoted because apart from you and i and others who are keen investigators uh, you, you you should know about it you know and, and i think they need to reflect on that as well but I think listening to to you, uh, it's almost reminding me. Remember the days when pe people used to hijack hashtags? Yes, to yeah. Almost be seen to be uh, you know, on trend, whatever. But for me, it's almost the the, the kind of the old, very old adage of actions speak louder than words. And, and and I think you've got to really be clear that it so happens that it's part of your core values, part of you know what you do. It's part of the culture of the business. And you're right, you know. Most businesses I'm aware of who do amazing, have a, make an amazing contribution to the wider community, tend to be actually very discreet and modest about it. And, and I think you've got to just just get it right. Because also, you know, it's, it's about time and effort. If you spend time and effort on that, then what about your core setting message? And I can imagine that many of those marketers, oddly, who have been asked by their seniors to do so, they're going to be taken to task because somehow the sales target is not being met because there's only so much communication communication you can do very quickly on linkedin a couple of things that they've done so they are continuing to promote this um creator profile now on behalf of my customers can i just tell you natalie and of course i'm addressing as if you can do anything about it sorry but <laughs> my my customers really find that the the the, uh, the language and terminology of putting this well i'm not a creator therefore i'm going to pass uh, and i think i understand that because we've heard the term creator for Actually, very clearly, other form of occupation, uh, Instagram is one of them, Pinterest is the other, where you create a product. And when I've looked into it, and when you switch to your account, you know, you get a, a, a few more um, kind of features for your profile, which are very, very attractive. You know, you get the subscribe um, bell, as they call it. You can add a, a profile video. You can highlight a newsletter. That is a plugin now. So you can do all sorts of things, but the term creator I think it's just not quite right for a, a large B2B community. What do you think? I would definitely agree, particularly on LinkedIn and, and the, the sort of the LinkedIn space. To me, um, being creative is not root. Well, I mean, this is just my perspective on it. So perhaps others will, will disagree. <laughs> but my perspective on it is that to be, if I was going to be creative, I might doodle or sketch or write, and that would be my kind, my kind of creative outlet. But if I was going to record a really great LinkedIn video that was, you know, a couple of minutes long and packed with like some really impactful tips, I wouldn't regard that as a created piece. I would regard that as professional work. So. I think it sort of like creates that sense of disconnect between what you're trying to achieve on the, the platform and whether you are a creative. Some of the best content that I've ever seen on LinkedIn has come from accountants that are sharing best practice tax advice. And you think, oh my goodness, I understand that now and no one's ever like ex explained it so clearly to me. Um, but that's not I, I would assume had not thought oh i put together this uh, this really helpful uh, kind of infographic and it's so creative so i think it's it's that and i don't know whether it needs perhaps a little bit of a rebrand in terms of, of what it is i would agree i think yeah. it also I think it also perhaps attracts people that are like, oh, I just want to talk about business best practice and not necessarily actually do anything and then just become a bit of a business influencer because there's definitely appetite for for that type of uh, 
type of lifestyle or, or kind of content profile. Um, so I think it, it is just the, the, the constant struggle of the creator label um, and whether it's even necessarily doing enough um, once people do get the, uh, the the kind of the new tools to like understand it um, and be able to you know say okay we've got enhanced analytics how do I actually apply them to understand which bits of my content work better I, do, I think it perhaps just gives them the label that they feel that they've bought into and then everything's taken care of. Absolutely. So what I've done, uh, um, everyone in the show notes, I've got the link to the LinkedIn official article with regard to the uh, creator profile. And you're right, we almost need to uh, tune out the word uh, creator. And I would say almost like the um, advanced profile or or whichever term you would prefer for actually key networkers and key kind of um, content contributors. Well, very quickly, just before we move on to a quick news roundup, um, we mentioned I mentioned Pinterest. So, have you got some news for us? Yes. So, last time at our point of recording, we were just pre Pinterest presents, and um, we are now post Pinterest presents. Um, and there were some really, really great sessions. So, they're all available on Catch Up. So, if you are interested at all in upping your Pinterest strategy in 2020. I would definitely recommend checking them out and even if you've got a little bit of spare time if you, Pinterest is not your bag and it's not a platform for you there's still some really invaluable insights as to overall uh, web usage what people are looking for consumer behaviors um, so there's definitely a, a worthwhile kind of treasure trove of uh, content to be discovered there and I've got to say particularly in line with some of the other um, I guess social networks that have recently done conferences or facilities. The Pinterest one is always perfect. It runs seamlessly. It runs to time. Um, The sets and the audio quality are always very well done. They hold themselves to a very, very high standard, uh, which I think we can all aspire to be because who doesn't want their production to be really slick and their content to be really clear and well delivered. So a little shout out to how awesome Pinterest is um, for just simply keep delivering really high quality uh, marketing insights. Will you share the hyperlink? Can I put it on the show notes? Yeah? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Super. Well, listen, this is a bit of a fast um, news roundup for you. I'm going to go through the news items. You're going to pick one or two that really kind of, uh, ooh, that's interesting. We talk about conference where Snapchat have got their 2022 Partner Summit uh, on the 28th of April. Snapchat, again, is now adding YouTube link stickers. So you can share videos from YouTube on Snapchat. Meta is also launching a share to reels option to be added on websites and the likes. I think it's fascinating. TikTok has partnered with Instacart to create shoppable recipes. So if you watch a um, someone cooking something on TikTok, you can buy the product as you're watching the video. YouTube, still thinking about becoming a podcast network, it's becoming more and more reality. They also revealed five new live streaming features all inspired by Instagram, TikTok, and Twitch. Why not? The Marmite's Flipping Tasty Pancake Day social media ad was number one in the UK. We saw a six-second advert of a squirrel flipping pancakes on top of a jar of Marmite. I need to ask you where you stand with Marmite, but been a button particularly. Instagram <laughs> has updated its editing process within Reels. So you know, you can reorder. You can essentially use what they call the Reels Composer. And finally... The one that really surprised me was that once again, Meta has upset lots of people by introducing the Meta Business Suite instead of the business manager or even the content creator. So bad. Okay, so these are the fast news items. A couple of them perhaps interest you? Yeah, so the uh, the new Meta Suite is just, again, another, <laughs> another thing um, to kind of contend with. We don't see great functionality between the different suites. So this is something that, um, you know, I, I'm sure for a lot of people uh, kind of watching or listening, um, it, it may well catch you out. So just be very, very careful about what, what suite you're in at any any given moment. Um, you don't want to be creating content on one suite that you're then locked out on another. Um, and we, we honestly, we have this sort of, on a day-to-day basis in, in the office of making sure everything goes out on a consistent suite that can be used well across all of the team. Um, no surprise really to see that the, the winner on Pancake Day was something that was a little bit fun um, and a little bit different and a little bit quirky. And it shows that there is still opportunity for great marketing to just capture audience attention in a way that, that 
wouldn't necessarily um you know be the most uh, poignant or the most kind of breathtaking or the most um kind of i guess thought provoking it's just fun it's just nice it just creates that really positive sentiment around the brand which is exactly the type of uh, kind of marketing that creates those really long-term relationships with audiences um so yeah really interesting roundup and again another sign of a super busy month for all these platforms it's been incredible so can i ask you it's going to be almost live consultancy one of my customers um bless her she, she's just really thrown out um with this introduction without any kind of uh, prior warning of the meta business suite and she's used to the facebook a business manager now there is an option within the meta business suite to re revert back to what you used to know do you see any problems with that because she's quite keen and i did say well actually i've got someone i'm talking to very soon <laughs> to ask the question <laughs> um what i would probably do and this is genuinely if it was me i would allow myself to revert back yeah. but they're gonna remove that functionality Eventually. at some point. Mm -hmm. So while you've still got the opportunity to swap and you should be able to swap directly between them, it should allow you to then go back in, come back out, go back in, come back out. Um, I would probably just allow myself a bit more of an expanded timeline. So where you might have, you know, you're busy with all of the other things that you've got to do, all the other marketing activities, all the other business activities. So allow yourself that kindness of, okay, I'm just going to switch back to the previous one. And then I'm going to get all my work kind of rattled out. I'm going to make sure my content's really good to have all my priorities. But I would at some point either carve a bit of extra time to commit fully in that schedule or just try for the next couple of weeks to maybe spend an hour a week just sort of getting familiar with that new layout and seeing how it works um, because it will sort of allow you to just transition a bit more smoothly into that space is how I would absolutely do it. The other options are that you just go total gung ho and just accept that you can have a terrible scheduling time for a week or two on the new system, or you can revert back entirely and just sort of wait it out. You might get away with it for months. You might even get away mm. with this for years because Facebook is not terribly consistent with keeping everything updated. Um, but yeah, my advice would probably be just accept the reality and uh, kind of slowly get yourself used to uh, the new normal. And the new normal is never good. So <laughs> we'll just have to kind of go with whatever, whatever the Facebook meta gods decide, unfortunately. No, that's great. That reminds me a bit of the, the YouTube, you know, dashboard. Um, we all reverted to the old one. And eventually, um, it was imposed upon us. I think that the Facebook did the same with live streaming. But very quickly, so the uh, flipping tasty and the squirrel, this was my might peanut butter, which are frankly, for me, two horrible in, um, you know, <laughs> human inventions. But perhaps, do you like Marmite? Do you like peanut butter? Um, I'm not big on Marmite, but I do really like peanut butter. Do it's got to be crazy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you must have had a good peanut butter, would be my argument for that. <laughs> yeah, and the idea of putting this on pancake, as opposed to my preference would be Nutella, um, chocolate oh, spread. You know, and pancake. Always a good choice. Always, always a good, a good choice. choice. All right. <laughs> Thank you so much. We did the very best to kind of keep everything quite tight time-wise, but there was so much to give an update on. Makes sense. We just uh, completed pretty much the first quarter of the year. We're going to move on to our second segment, which is about strategies and things to try. So we're going to talk about the article of the month I'd like you to read. Natalie, you're going to tell us about the strategy of the month, the social tool of the month, and I'll close with the content creation uh, app of the month as well. In terms of artic article of the month, I think you gave um, a hint earlier. Um, Instagram for business has been very, very busy creating resources and they have the um, the small business how-to guide and they have eight case studies and it's done more like a brochure so it's very, very swift to read and within all those eight case studies they have essentially tactics and, and, and options for you to consider to get more engagement and success on your Instagram and I think this is just a lovely thing to do. One thing I will, uh, I'm, I'm realizing more and more as a trainer, as, as a mentor, is that it is hard to remember everything. Even for me, uh, I so need to forever, you know, uh, look again at training content and prepare. I can't just turn up on the day because all the different facets of digital marketing. And I think this is something that you should have almost on your phone and on your laptop ready to be read more than once across the year 
So I put a hyperlink um, on, on the um, on the show notes. It's called Getting Started, but actually it's better than that. It's literally, you are already on Instagram, and here are eight stories, and within that, each have two or three tips about how you can get more from Instagram. So that would be my article, but I would argue it's the resource of the month. Can we move on to your strategy of the month, please? Yes, absolutely. So my strategy of the month is make sure whatever platform you're on, you are working hard to establish a monogamous relationship with your customer. And what that means is understanding fully your purchase cycle that your audiences go through. So think about what you sell, whether it's a product or a service, and how quickly your customer goes from that point of purchase through to purchasing again from you. And if you own a coffee shop and people buy coffee on their way to work, your your purchase cycle is very, very simple. They buy the coffee on the way to work, they drink the coffee, the, then the next day they walk past again, they come in for another coffee. You're very, very, very speedy purchase cycle. You might do something that is training or consultancy, you might be an accountant, so your purchase cycle which might be much longer. If you retail cars, the average user might buy a three your PCP, change the car in three years time. So your purchase cycle is three years. Now between that customer purchasing from you and actually coming back to purchase a second time, how do we create a monogamous relationship? So their eyes aren't being turned by other coffee vendors or other car dealerships. We're keeping them on track with you. And the way to do that is through getting a full handle on the content that you are sharing and adding those creative, meaningful points and a little bit like our um, kind of pancake day example, making sure that we are keeping things light and fun and that positive engagement with the brand. The speed and the volume at which you can continue to sell, sell, sell will depend on how quickly your customers get through that purchase cycle. If you're on a longer purchase cycle, you need more of that content Content that builds the relationship doesn't necessarily ask for too much from your audiences and if you're on a short purchase cycle you can do a little bit more on the selling but you still do need to keep that balance so that your audiences don't feel that it's an entirely one-sided relationship you're actually in a committed relationship that benefits both parties social media is a fantastic tool to do this whatever your platform of choice because it puts you in an ongoing dialogue but make sure that you are being interesting and charming and you're doing your dinner party best with your audiences rather than just sell 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 and so have a think about that monogamous relationship and what that means for your audiences how you can add value and how you can create that commitment and I know that this is a message that you have shared many a time on this show and, and beyond, and, and likewise, this idea of it's only natural that what people are used to and comfortable doing is promotion, and mm-hmm. what we want is, of course, participation, and there are therefore other form of content that you've got to introduce, and I love the idea of understanding enough about your not sales cycle, but buying cycle. I think that's really what you're asking us to do, to time the other form of content just right, you know, because it's a bit like I have um, a lot of customers who are event organizers and they do yearly conference, sometimes quarterly conference. And the challenge that I set to them saying, so the conference, you know, what what is the message on social media? We are about to have a conference. We are having a conference. We had a conference. It just feels awfully, you know, self-centered to begin with, but there's nothing for me as an audience to react to and participate. And then what do you talk about for the, you know, if it's a yearly conference, you have 11 months of the year to keep the audience engaged. You can't just talk about the conference for 11 months saying it was a lovely one or the next one is going to be very good. So you've got to start to step back a bit, maybe slow things down, organize that um, discussion if you are part of a small team join that business club join that mastermind group listen to shows like such as this one to trigger that spark of, of an idea and then execute on that super so what would be your social media tool of the month 
So I've gone for a bit of a light one um, okay. since it's been quite a heavy session um, overall. Um, and my social media tool of the month is an app called Brain.fm. Um, and this is just a little bit of a really cool tool. Um, I have it on my phone. And essentially, you're able to match music to what you want to achieve throughout your workday. Um, it also works for your downtime. So if you want to have a super productive hour, um, there's lots of little tunes that will help kickstart that productivity. It's nice because it's the type of music that you are listening to but you can completely zone out and really give your dedication to the work um, if it's something that requires a bit of a deep dive there's some um, kind of music to match that particular mood if you are trying to chill out um, they have lots of kind of more serene uh, music that you can listen to as well and it even has um, for those of us that might have a million work thoughts whirring around in our brain at night uh, even has music that will help with sleep and uh, kind of relaxation for outside of work so yeah just a cool little quirky find that i've been really enjoying for this month this is amazing um do i have your permission <laughs> to add this on to the um two geeks and marketing podcast show as well yes of course Full and i hope you guys given. enjoy it <laughs> I say, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a shout out, but this is exactly the kind of thing even Roger would, would love uh, to know about. But going back to the social media news um, uh, roundup, today's recording, the content creation of the month. So this is all to do with live streaming. As you know, big fan, I run courses and I, I give um, coaching kind of sessions to, to customers who want to launch their live shows. And there's a small tension, small nervousness about audience participation. Two things. What if nobody um watches live and ask me any questions or if they have maybe it's a small number they don't ask any questions maybe i've got too many questions you've got all, all, the, all those extremes and i've been thinking about it, thinking maybe we need to rethink the, the whole live and audience participation more in terms of not live interaction but live contribution what i mean to say is you should be able to actually plan your your live show with actually messages you have received in advance from, from, from the audience as opposed to actually putting pressure on yourself and them to be attending live. Because actually, as you well know, the numbers of people watching on replay is always much, much greater than the live audience. And the live audience is there to actually make you be in conversation mode. So this idea of audience contribution where they would send you a message before, or a question before the show and you used that to actually and you made the show. And I thought it would be lovely if you was a voice message and or a video message so i realize i'm breaking the rule because i'm going to mention two apps but i think i should be allowed so the first one is called speak pipe speak as in speaking uh, words speak pipe allows somebody to record a voicemail message and email that to you so you would share on the show perhaps via email so on send me your your voice messages you put a link to your speak pipe account and people would record a message which you could then play live during your you know your show which i think is exciting and then for video messages i came across actually a google product google have essentially almost like a um, business incubator unit i think they're called a120 and the, uh, inventors from other world can pitch and literally be financed by google to create products and this one is called threadit and thread it, it will integrate with your Google Chrome as an extension, but also within your Gmail. And you click on the icon and literally can record a video message and email that to whoever asked you to email the video message. So once again, you then have a video file that you can play live during your social media kind of uh, session and use that as part of audience contribution and take the pressure off that audience interaction. So speak pipe and thread it. <laughs> so listen, thank you so much. And we've done pretty well, actually, time-wise, in terms of the recording. We're just under the hour, which is more so like us, frankly. <laughs> Agreed. I think we worked very hard to uh, to get everything covered. <laughs> no, absolutely. So, listen, Natalie, thank you so much once again for joining me on the Social Media News Roundup. It's always a pleasure. And like I say, it creates the discipline of keeping track and also reflecting on what we do. So, um, as uh, our commitment to you, viewers and listeners, we're going to recall the next one a bit later on in May, just after the Conversations Conference organized by Meta 
will be known as Facebook. Natalie, once again, big, big thank you for all your time and the research and your wonderful advice to your viewers and listeners. Thank you for your support. This was the Social Media Newsroom. Remember, this is called social media. So go out there and be sociable. Bye for now. Bye.